All right, I think if everyone's ready, um, I'll give a brief introduction about what we do here at Lead Ventures, or Lead Capital. So before I talk about Lead, Vet, Lead Capital, which is our equity crowdfunding arm, I'd like to give you guys a bit of introduction of our main company, which is Lead Ventures. So what we do is we have ran accelerators as well as been a venture capital firm for over 10 years. Our main value proposition for our companies is that we provide management consulting, market access, as well as funding. So I'll let the numbers speak for itself, right? So our latest success story was Serna, where we managed to do a 75X within two to three years. It's an on-demand insurance platform. How we got involved was very early on. You know, it's an ideation stage where you know, the entrepreneurs didn't really know what they wanted to do. So then we helped shape them and also as well built that whole model in which now they operate. So in our internal fund, right, we've been generating about 34% annually on our portfolios. So then you probably ask, you know, why lead capital, right? You've been doing so well in the venture space. So I think the main reason for this is because we see a very large funding gap, right? So okay, what do I mean, right? So the main players in the space right now is also our venture capital firms as well as private equity firms. So the mandate for venture capital firms are, you know, it has to be very scalable. You know, you got to be scaling across regions really fast. And for private equity firms, they look at more traditional mm -hmm. businesses and mm -hmm. on demand mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. like TLI got involved was very fast. And for private equity firms, they look at more traditional mm -hmm. businesses. It's a, all right. So having a bit of technical issues. Sorry about that, guys. So then right now, uh, uh, so there's a lot of promising companies that actually slip through the cracks, right? You can think of Green Factory, for example, which you'll hear more on later on. So they have been in the they've been in space for 30 years, but mainly they've been catering for um government projects. But right now they are transitioning and then pivoting to catering towards private markets, which they have seen a very strong growth in demand, which they'll share more in later on. So okay, back to raising for these promising companies that actually um, slip through the cracks, right? So if you think about what, what do I mean by promising company? So I, I'll give you a bit of examples. So if you look at QMED, right? So what they do is that they digitalize existing healthcare providers. So if you look at the rate of NCDs, right, which is your diabetes, high blood pressure, they're all going up and the population is also aging. So eventually it'll be a state where it would actually paralyze your existing healthcare providers, so what QMED can, can do is help these healthcare providers you know, focus more on value-add solutions instead of you know, on their traditional ongoing um, this, um, operations, which actually waste a lot of the doctor's time. So notably, up to now, they've digitalized over 4,000 healthcare providers, and also they have partnered up with Qualitas, to, you know, one of the largest clinic chains, to digitalize everything across the board. So that's what we mean by promising. So aside from that, you know, we'll be introducing two other companies today, which would be, you know, I, I hope that you're excited for. So it's Green Factory as well as Arus Oil. So what Green Factory is doing, you know, they're combating deforestation through sustainable manufacturing. Because if you look at the ESG space, it's definitely heating up, right? By 2025, you know, Bursa is, is doing a line-by-line -line item audit on their ESG reports. So this is something to be taken seriously. And as well as Arus Oil, right? You know, right now, everyone's talking about how do I find a sustainable source of fuel? And that's what they do. They help provide um, biodiesel guys the uptake for them to convert that into um, biodiesel and also everything else, right? So, okay, that's on the issuer side, right? Let's just say you can get access to all these quality deals as well as, you know, making a change by investing in each and every one of these companies. The other side is the investors. So typically, like, you know, we talk about QMAT, we talk about Green Factory, Arrows Oil, but typically your retail investor, they won't have access to this kind of deals, right? Like, and if not just access, the other things that you guys would probably be looking at is also public markets as well as FD, right? FD, you know, is definitely not going to outperform inflation at this rate. And for public markets, you know, it's probably going to be a recession soon. And, you know, they're not going to have some serious upside lot unless they're thinking about buying. So that's where we come in, right? Um, we want to fund promising companies, impactful companies, as well as provide investors a form of portfolio diversification. Because if you look at growth investing, these guys are still going to perform well during a recession, you know? No one's going to stop going to healthcare. No one's going to um, not take ESG seriously because it is 
a very big tailwind that's going to happen. So aside from all that, you probably ask us, you know, how are we different, right, as a ECF platform compared to, you know, the, the other likes, right, you know, like Pitchin, you have Ata Plus, whatnot. So I think the main difference here is that we come from an investment background and, you know, each one of our deals is either backed by us or are going to be backed by us. I think one thing that I would definitely say this proudly is that each and every one of the deals are invested by our founder. So that's what we mean, right? We don't just raise for any and everyone. No, we want to see the change in the ecosystem. And then that's why we bring these companies on and get them funded so they can do the change that they like. So I think my call to action to you is if you want to see more of these deals as well as have access to early bird privileges, head on over to lead.capital and create an account and see for yourself. And aside from that, if you are an angel and you're looking for more high, high risk deals which, with higher returns, feel free to email us or just register as an angel and provide the verification that we need. I think that's about it and what we do at um, Lead Capital. I'll hand on over to Shannon to introduce the companies. Thank you, Wig. Um, so first off, um, thank you everyone for joining us in this Speech Tuesday session. Um, we'd like to invite our first company, which is uh, Harif, uh, for the first pitch for tonight. So Harif, also known as the Green Carpenter, uh, more popular on LinkedIn, right? He is the founder of the Green Factory, and they are a manufacturing sustainable wood products, such as your furniture, homeware, gifts, etc., right? With sustainability at its core, um, and also through circular manufacturing. Um, they have worked with very, very prominent clients, such as Petronas, Coca-Cola, PNB, Maybank, Farm Fresh, and Rolls Royce, and many more, right? So they are also one of the first unlisted um, public company, um, basically the first Berhard to be raising via equity crowdfunding. So without further ado, I'll pass the time to Harif. Um, you may share your screen. Um, you have 15 minutes to pitch, and thereafter, you know, um, we can do our Q&A sessions to address any questions um, you guys have. Feel free to also drop any questions in the chat. Um, we will address them during the Q&A. Harif, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shannon. Uh, thank you also, Winglock. Uh, before that, can I check if you guys can hear me? Can you type one? on the, the the chat awesome 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 so thank you very much guys for coming in tonight i know a lot of you guys cannot make it to the factory tour um, but i i would love for you guys to come over my place uh, one of these days if you decide to invest in us and see what we do um live um okay so today i'm going to talk a little bit about the pitch uh, for the company Hey, why can I move? Okay, just a little bit about myself. Um, since I was 11 years old, I would be going to the factory during school holidays, especially. So when um, people go on holiday, I have to go work. It wasn't that fun, but uh, I grew up in the industry and I was exposed to it at a very, very early age. So in 2008, um, I finished my study and I came back to Malaysia and joined the family business. And that is when I delved deeper into the industry. So at first, the company, um, we, we focus a lot more on our legacy business, which is the tender and government. So we are a G7 contractor and we do supply a lot of furniture to the government. We are one of the very few licensed companies that can supply to the government. We supply to um, a lot of them like school furniture, your primary and secondary school. If you were in Selangor, KL or Perak, some of the furniture might come from our factory. So that uh, we've been doing that a lot. And then, um, so I, 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 when I came in, I opened up the venture business. So this is more of the open market and export business. So I, I look more into the business and the industry, and I'm going to share a little bit of my findings for the industry. So for your information, Malaysia is one of the largest exporter of wood products. For furniture, we are 
the number one. We are the one of the top 10 for furniture export. Last year, Malaysia export more than 12.7 billion worth of furniture. And at that time, there are more than 1,000 plus in the city year. And I noticed that there's not and there's no one that is looking into the green space. So, um, and then 2012 was the last straw when um, I came across the statistic that Malaysia has the highest rate of deforestation in the world. So uh, it, it hurts me because my business relates directly with forestry. So I decided, okay, I've grown up in the industry. I saw like there's a lot of waste being created. People don't really care where the material comes from as long as it's cheap and it's off standard. So I decided if I want to continue the business, I will want to do it in a more sustainable way. So 2012, we adopt the motto, saving the world one piece at a time, where we want to make sure that the things we do, no matter how small, contributes to making the world better. How we do it is we apply circular uh, principle into our business. So we don't just look at the material that we use. We look at the glue that we use, the coating that we use, the packaging that we use, and all the process, we try to make each process greener. At the same time, we work, we, work, we work with a lot of stakeholders. So these are the makers, the community, the industry, the government, media. And um, we push for more sustainability agenda acceptance with all the stakeholders. And fast forward now, it's more than a decade that we um, in the green business. We now produce sustainable work products such as furniture, homeware, and gifts. And we have sent our product to more than 20 countries. In 2018, we got our PEFC certification. So PEFC is a Europe certification that states that our wood comes from sustainable sources. This is particularly impo in important to export product overseas. And on that year as well, 2018, we were awarded the Good Design Award. So this is a Japanese award. So our first international award. They come to the, they came to the factory. They look at our operation and products, and we are one of the very few winners for that year. Because of the thing that we are doing is quite unique in a way. We have been mentioned in a lot of media local and international TV, radio, online and offline. And uh, these are all free advertising for us. Uh, we are so thankful for that. And because of that as well, we managed to get the attention of a lot of big brands. Um, notable one, we recently finished for Ferrari. And right now we, we are being engaged by Asia as well. And uh, Rolls Royce. Coca-Cola, to name a few. And mind you, they came to us. We don't knock on their door and say that, hey, you want to buy a product? They are the one that is contacting us. So we are in a way right now in the prime position where now everyone talks about sustainability. And because we have been investing in it and been developing our brand and our story, and now we are ripping it. Um, so this is our sale this past few years. Um, this is overall sales. If you see the yellow one, so these are the legacy sales. As you can see, the legacy sales, uh, because it's project-based, so it's it's really, you can't really predict it. So that's why we, we don't want to look into that. That's why we open up our uh, open market and export business because we believe that in open market, if your product is good, your service is good, um, people will buy from you. And it, there is more um, um, stability to it. So this is overall and the white one is the green business. So we want to zoom more into the green business. So this is um, how the venture business or green business uh, perform. This year, just to share with you, we have achieved more than 2.5 times of last year green revenue. And we are looking by the end of the year to triple it. 
So instead of uh, 2.5, we are looking by this year, we can triple the amount of green product last year. So this shows the traction that we have for this year. So these are the statistics for green products, but I won't go too much into it, but um, we can see it all over us right now. Even the government are looking into policy. Um, at, for a listed company, they have to do ESG reporting. Everyone talks about sustainability. So we ourselves, we've been getting so much uh, interest and query that we are unable to, um, to, to supply the demand. So that's why we decided, okay, and this will likely to continue and we want, so we want to cater to the, the market while it's still hot. So what we did was we started our uh, fundraising. We started off with co-founder round where we raised 3 million ringgit in 2019. And we closed it early of the year, like January. And that is due to COVID and all that, but we managed to close that round. So now we are on our angel investor round. So this is where we are raising 5 million ringgit at 30 million pre-money valuation. So this is the ECF offer. I'm sure you've seen it a lot. So I won't go into it, but if you want to go into it later, we can talk more of this. But what I want to share is um, what are the incentives for this investment for this time? So we have for early birds, we have bonus share. So what does it means? If you invest um, three to 10 lot, you are entitled to 5% additional bonus share. If 11 to 59 lots, you get 10% extra shares. And if 60 lots and above, uh, or 15K and above, you get 15% bonus share. So these guys are quite limited. It's only for early birds. So after the early birds, then you will go to normal rate. So no more bonus share. So if you look to invest, do invest uh, as early as you can to get the bonus. And this um, investment also is an ICPS. So what that means is you uh, confirm a dividend every year. Um, it is a cumulative evident, dividend. So the first year you will get 10% of your um, investment. Um, the second year you get 3%, uh, the third year you get 4%, the fourth and fifth year you get 5% dividend on your investment. So this is part of the ECF incentive. So what we are trying to do actually is within this five years time, we want to capture 1% of Malaysian furniture export, which is around 120 million. So this is our goal. How we are going to do it is we are going to acquire the chain. We're going to compete the chain. So right now we are in the middle, we, we, are, we are in the production side. What we're going to do is we're going to acquire a raw material company. And also we're going to make the green factory as a retail arm. So before this, all in one um, production or one company. Now we're going to focus it into retail, focusing on retail production, focusing on production, and we will acquire raw material. So the green factory, even though we need to achieve 120 million, but actually in actuality, we only need to focus on 60 million. Why? So this is why the chain is important. So if the 60 million um, generated in sales, they will have to go through the production, which um, will, let's say, 40 million of it will go into the production. And from the 40 million, uh, portion of it will be given to our raw material because we want raw material, right? So we will buy from ourselves as well. So 60 plus 40 plus 20, we get 120 million of group sales. So mind you, the raw material itself, the one that we are looking to acquire are doing around, around 10 million a year. So they, are, they have more um, opportunity to growth in the industry as well. So it doesn't have necessarily come from our retail. They will also have a market in Malaysia and international itself, which they can cater as well. Same as production. There are other ways that um, the company generates sales and all that. 
but what we want to look is more on the, the 60 million of the green factory. So I won't go much in detail, um, but we are looking to have um, the, the sale channel be local and export. So for the local, we have the B2B the, um, and also B2C. And export is um, both B2B and B2C. So why we believe we can do it? One is we are not a new company. We've been operation for 29 years. We have spent millions on the company. I've been to 15 countries. I, uh, we've invested a lot in our machine and trial and error. We all use our money. So right now, the money that you invested is not for trial and error. It's actually to do what we want to do is to, to um, uh, expand what we uh, see as the one that can run the business. And also we are first mover. We have the first mover advantage. We've been in the market for more than 10 years. And also our R&D factory um, is one of a kind in a way that we can produce hundreds of design and processes in a year. So we can keep innovating, updating, and also explore new market. So our management team uh, um, and experienced management team. So a lot of them have more than 10 years experience, but our secret sauce or our one of our strength is actually our manpower. Just to share with you, even though Malaysia have the, uh, a, a big market in the furniture, a lot of it, uh, of the workers in the industry are foreigner. So what we did was when we moved to the new factory in Ampang, we want to focus more on local um, development. Right now we have 45 staff, 90% are local, 80% are below 35. And 80% of our staff have diploma and above. So we have an educated workforce ready to take on the challenge. So what you're investing is not yet on me. What you're investing is on these 45 people. So with guidance and with more experience, they will bring the company to another level. Mind you, these are all uh, smart kids. We have award winner designers. We have uh, a master student, a master graduate. We have Dean's List kids. So smart kids want to be part of us and contribute to the course. So join us in investing in them. We now live in an era where we already have enough knowledge to make money and at the same time contribute to making the world better. So thank you. Thank you, Harif. Um, there are a few questions in the chat, so maybe we want to address them. Sure. Um, so first off, the first question is from James, right? So he's trying to find out, like, how do you actually work with corporates and how do you ensure a healthy pipeline of corporate customers? Okay. So um, just to share with you how we operate. Right now, the easiest or the lowest hanging fruit in terms of getting the sales are from corporate because they are the one that have to comply to the ESG reporting and all that. So that is why right now we are having a lot of those corporate clients. So the corporate client, of course, some of them come and go, but a lot of them um, do come to us every year. For example, we make trophies for star property. Star property. We did for several of star events, star property, star um, hearts and all that. But um, they have been doing us uh, like for three years already. So every time they order around 80 plus trophies and all that. So we do have customers that come and go. But at the same time, we do have a lot of customers that stay because the requirements is always the same. For example, corporate game. Every year they have to give corporate game. Every year they have to do events and all that. So if we can manage that relationship and we can uh, cater to their demand, we will have more of a continuous um, uh, supply, uh, sales basically. I think we can go a little bit more deeper than that, but that is generally what we are seeing. Uh, and it's not going any less. We have to, right now, our issue is not really sales. We have to say no to a lot of the order and sale because our capacity is not enough. 
So that's why our main priority right now is to increase our capacity. Just to share with you, last year we do 5.6 million. You know how many salesperson we have? Only two. And these are not full time. So imagine if we can add more people there, which we intend to add. All right. So um, we are a bit time sensitive, right? So we'll go on to, with the next um, question, right? Um, just a quick one. And so, so um, could you share a little bit on dividend, right? Um, so someone um, basically Raja asked, right, first year 10% or 2% dividend. Maybe you want to clarify that? Um, so it's the first year is 2%. 2% dividend. Okay. Um, the next question is, have you identified the target companies for acquisition? Um, what are the status of this? Sure. Um, so we have identified a few companies um, and we have have initial talk. And uh, some of them do want to move further and be part of us as well. So now it's more on getting the funds and actually finalizing details. But in general, they want to be part of us because we are looking into share swap as well. So they will be part of us as well. So these companies are um, experienced companies. So we don't really have to micromanage them. They've been in the industry for quite some time and they have a lot of opportunity to grow themselves in the industry. So that's why they do require some additional funds as well, which we are going to channel for them to also grow their sales. All right. Thank you, Harif. Um, so I think without further ado, we'll wrap this up. I think, Harif, you can address any other questions that happens on Zoom. So just to give an overview, so the Green Factory is currently raising um, via ECF um, on lead capital. The campaign um, will basically go live in December. So pre-register now to get that early bird access, right, to basically know and be the first, you know, to sort of get that bonus share that Harif mentioned earlier. So without further ado, we'd like to invite um, Dr. Chai. Dr. Chai, are you ready? Mm -hmm. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Chai, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of Iris Oil, to basically pitch. Um, they are a startup, you know, to monetize your used cooking oil to basically power the growing biodiesel, um, biodiesel um, market. So they are currently also an official collaborator with Shell to increase collection points. So you can actually recycle um, your used cooking oil in selected shell um, pickup points and also IOI properties um, to basically get the uptake of used cooking oils. So Dr. Chai, over to you um, to share more about Iris Oil. Hello, hi, uh, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, uh, one, two, three, seven, this venture uh, for inviting us for this pitching session. Uh, can hear, right, yeah. So, okay, hi. Um, my name is Dr. Chai. I'm actually uh, the Chief Marketing Officer for Arus Oil. What we are is we are on-demand used cooking oil recycling platform where we try to bring the convenience of recycling used cooking oil to your doorstep. So yeah, we are MPOB certified and uh, we are in the midst of getting our ISCC certification, which is a compliancy for European recycling used cooking oil. Yeah, carbon sustainability. All right, so uh, why we start this? Of course, when we start, we always talk about the pain point. So in Malaysia, uh, we have a big gap when it comes to recycling used cooking oil. Uh, we are one of the biggest market share when it comes to palm oil. We produce about 30% of, sorry, I think there's a typo in the slides. We produce about 30% of used palm oil in the global scale, export only number two to Indonesia. But when it comes to recycling used cooking oil, means collecting back our waste cooking oil, we are only holding 3% of the market share in, in, in the world. So uh, <clears throat> then we asked the question, why? So why me and my partner Han, we started this uh, company is because there was a raging issue with why are we producing so much oil, but we are not recycling enough to justify how much we are planting, right? So we did a market survey and we did a lot of research and we asked around and asked here and there. We found out that actually used cooking oil has already been recycled a lot. When it comes to Malaysia, it's about a 10-year industry. Hotels, FMB, big players, big uh, hotel chains are already recycling their used cooking oil on a regular basis. But then when we look about the FMB segment, uh, we look at the household segment, we don't see much of people that is recycling used cooking oil. We conducted a survey before we started this business and we found out that as uh, you and I, as our parents and us, 
most of us, we throw it down the drain. So uh, we did a survey, we found out that a lot of people throw it down the drain. Some people uh, just, they freeze it up and then they throw it into the, they throw it into the dustbin, which eventually goes into the, into the landfill. And the most uh, dangerous of all is some people actually don't recycle or use cooking oil at all. They use it over and over and over again. Uh, and eventually it becomes in your nasi goreng or your mee goreng. That's why your mee goreng and nasi goreng look so and taste so good. Yeah, so that is that will of course impact environmentally and also impact our health issue. Lah. So that's why uh, we found that there was a market in the household segment. So we started the company last year and uh, <clears throat> did most of it and we found out that there is a big gap. In Malaysia, annually, we produce about 19 million metric tons of cooking oil, palm oil. Mm -hmm. Uh, domestically, when we are using, consuming, is about 500,000 metric tons. And out of the 500,000 metric tons which is consumed domestically, FMB use a portion of it and household use a portion of it, which is roughly about half, 300,000 metric tons and 200,000 metric tons. And if you count into accommodation, every time you cook and there should be some oil retained in, in your food, uh, we should collect at least 80% from 500,000. But last year, according to latest statistics of data, we only collected 192,000 metric tons. There is a shortage of at least 200,000 metric tons more. So the question is where? And we identify that it is in the household market. So we did a simple projection of uh, the number of households in Malaysia and breaking it down by, uh, uh, <clears throat> by the social status, B40, B20, and B20. We found out that a lot of us actually don't recycle and use cooking oil. On average, if everyone give about one, a household give about two uh, kg of used cooking oil per month, we should get about 24,000 metric tons monthly. Divide times it by annually and we get about 180,000 metric tons. So uh, that's why we started Arus Oil. So when you go down to the question and ask people, why aren't you recycling your used cooking oil? The simple question is, it's very dirty and oily and it's very hard for me to recycle used cooking oil. When I throw it, it's easier for me to just throw it down the drain. It's easier for me to just put it there. And then tomorrow, I want to fry egg. I use the same oil and stuff like that. So we found out there's a lot of challenges. Number one is, of course, the convenience of recycling use cooking oil. And number two is, of course, the awareness. Many do not know that they can actually re recycle their used cooking oil because they find that it's not worthwhile. If you are running an FMB chain or restaurant, you collect used cooking oil on about 100, 200 kg per month. It makes sense for you to compile and sell it off. But if you are just at home, uh, it doesn't make sense for you, not worth the extra mile effort for you. We tried many things before we actually started. We tried having a collection center in our Padang. We tried uh, having a recycling center. Uh, yes, for dry waste, people do recycle. But when it comes to something oily and dirty, people are not willing to actually bring their dirty materials into the into their car, into their well fire or their Audi and bring it to the recycling center. That's when we started Arus Oil. <clears throat> so it's a recycling cooking oil platform, oil available on Apple and Google Play, uh, Play Store. Uh, what we do is we provide users a seamless experience to recycle they use cooking oil by just a click away. So they can schedule for appointment and our drivers uh, will, will get in touch with them and all status update will be updated in the or will be updated into the app. Uh, apart from that, they will get a transparent uh, visual of how much they are earning because we are buying used cooking oil from them. They get a transparent visual and also they get to see how much carbon saving they actually do by recycling used cooking oil. Of course, when it comes to this, there are two methods uh, for us to be worried of because we are doing something where we need to make money and yet we also need to look at the carbon possibility of it. We cannot be going somewhere very far to collect one kg of oil and come back. At the end of the day, we lose on operation costs and also we lose on the carbon savings. So that's why the, with the help of the app and concentration, we can schedule routing to try to improve and optimize the carbon spend to collect used cooking oil and the, and the amount of cost like for us in terms of our driver and our, our petrol and our diesel for our vehicles. All oil will be collected and sent to our factory, which is in our UHJ1 where we do a pre-treatment and eventually will be converted into biodiesel. Yeah. Uh, we are MPOB license holder. And uh, like I said before, we are trying, we are in the midst of uh, getting our ISCC, International Sustainable Carbon Certification Certificate, hopefully due next year, Q1 or two. 
So uh, users will be able to transparently view all their activities in the app. They can see how much money they earn and they can see how much carbon credit they earn. So uh, we do work with some corporates, example, IOI, where IOI, we are, we are servicing IOI residents in uh, Puchong, Sepang and Sierra 16. And all these carbon savings will be accumulated and will be briefed and will be reported to IOI so that they can include it into their sustainability report or the report yearly. So uh, on top of that, every user also will be, will be reported on how much they actually save in terms of carbon. Uh, so our business model is fairly simple. We collect used cooking oil from household. We call them UCO producers. We buy it at a portion for them. It range from one ringgit to three ringgit fifty cent. Uh, our drivers will collect it from them on the scheduling on the app, and we actually sell it to a biodiesel manufacturer. We do a pre-treatment in our facility USJ one uh, before we actually make the uh, the sales to a biodiesel manufacturer. So, uh, of course, prices are volatile. Uh, as you can see, it's a commodity where price can go up and down a lot. Uh, so, we base it on the percentage of CPO price. That's why we are actually locked to MPOB. Uh, it's just a brief of our user experience. Users make an appointment, driver will come, verify the weight, and we will pay them through the app. In the app, the users will be given a wallet where they can choose to cash it out or they can choose to donate it out to certain certain NGOs that we have on board with us, or they can choose to redeem with some of our collaborative partner. So at the moment, we are working with Shell where they can redeem some Shell vouchers that they can use in Shell Select um, stores in the petrol station. And also we are working with another company to do uh, UCO, uh, these sustainable candles, scented candles. Lah. So they can choose to redeem that. Uh, so this is uh, what we do in the market. We are the first to come up with a 5 kg MOQ. Previously, there are a lot of collectors that actually go around and collect from restaurants and hotels, but we are the first to actually come up with a 5 kg MOQ. We do provide them if customers require with a jerry can, 5 kg. And once the jerry can is full, we come and collect it from them. And uh, yeah, we are the first in the market. Yeah, we are also thinking of trying to reduce the MOQ, but we haven't done decided on the sweet spot for carbon saving and operational costs. Of course, when concentration grows, then we can actually reduce MOQ to even lower so people can churn out used cooking oil at a faster rate. Uh, apart from that, our greatest pain point is of course awareness. Like I mentioned, uh, people don't really know that they can recycle and they don't know the harmful effects that it have to the environment and also to, the, to their health. That's why we go around and do a lot of awareness talk. This is uh, one of the biggest operations for us. Uh, I think so with all green sustainable companies, you have to start off with awareness. So we hope that when we give out this awareness, there'll be more UCO collection in the country and we'll be there to collect it from them in the market. Uh, just a little projection. We actually started off in October 2021, last year. Uh, we launched the app on the Apple Google based on a startup operation of last year. Uh, this is just a project. Of course, we started off, uh, we are fairly new. But we started off with about 100-200 kg a month and now we grow to an average about 25 to 35 metric tons per month, uh, month on month. Of course, uh, this number is growing. Yeah. And in terms of uh, revenue rise from 30 metric tons, we get about 150 to about 200,000 per month in terms of revenue. Uh, our gross profit from the revenue is about 30 to 35% and our net profit to month. Net gross profit meaning when we have the oil, we sell it to someone that's our gross profit and then uh, we also have a net profit for our operational costs and our uh, overhead charges. So total we have done about close to, we have done slightly above a million since October 2021 and uh, yeah. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the CPO price is volatile. If you can just check the MPOB daily CPO price, you can see that the price has dipped a lot significantly in Q3, Q4 of this year. Uh, but what again is we go based on the percentage of the UCO. So when uh, the price is low, we buy a, a lower percentage. We buy the same percentage, but a different pricing from our users, from our FMB and uh, from our hotels. So we project that uh, the commodity will be stagnant for the following year. And that's how our projection works. Uh, we started in October of last year. To date, in our app, we have about 3,400 users with close to 1,100 actively recycling, which is about 30% of uh, people actively recycling. At least one to three monthly, they recycle once. From that, 
users, we have still a portion that are in the FMB, which is 70% are still in the commercial segment and 30% are in the household segment. Uh, and we are doing about 30 to 35 metric tons per month, which generates about 150 to 180,000 ringgit a month. Uh, these are just some of our clients. So when we started off Arus Oil, we had to work with a lot of uh, partners. We work with JMBs, we work with property developers, we work with RA, uh, resident associations. We work with uh, a lot of uh, other green companies to push out the awareness so that people can recycle in the ground. Apart from that, we also service certain uh, segments of the FMB and the hotels. Like uh, we, are, we are servicing YTY YT hotels and Med Stripes hotels. And we are also servicing some uh, FMB chains like Lotus and Canteen yeah, and My News. Uh, this is our roadmap. Like, like I said, we started development, the app in September, and we start launching it officially in October. We started off with awareness campaign. And right now we are establishing with Shell, like uh, Shannon has mentioned, we are working together with Shell to establish collection points, which works like a not so, not so much of a recycling center, but a collection point where our drivers can actually collect and drop it off there. So it, to reduce the cost of the driver to move in terms of diesel, carbon emission, and in terms of how much time they need to collect the point from the users. Uh, we have uh, in our plans to roll out a gig economy uh, of course, the, the, the thing of it is has to be uh, ironed out properly because there's a lot of uh, legislation issues that we have to iron out before we actually move out. And in the future, we actually intend to have a smart tank which has a, some sort like a reverse vending machine that can do the tracking and can allow users to recycle the use quickly right at the convenience in any time, any day of their life. Uh, just, just some pictures of us. Uh, we launched with Shell in, uh, two months ago in Penang, where we established a Shell station as a collection hub. So this pilot project was done in Penang because it's a, it's a closed circuit environment. And what we intend to do is with the awareness of Shell database and also the redeem of the Shell vouchers, uh, we want to reach out to the end users. Uh, yeah, just some pictures of us. So uh, you can redeem if you're in Penang. You can redeem a jerry can from the shell stations and start call, call, start collecting your UCO at home. Uh, yeah, this is in the R&D stages. Of course, this is just a sketch. Uh, we haven't finalized the, the design and the feasibility of it. But yeah, the idea is to have a reverse vending machine with, the, with a sensor that users can actually pour or they can be sucked from a user's bottle. And it can track to us through the app and actually give them a real-time transaction and real-time carbon saving uh, tracking. So we are asking for 1 million in total, our cumulative uh, fundraising round, for mainly for our expansion. Because right now we are in Klang Valley from uh, slightly above uh, Rawang all the way to Seremban. And we just established a used cooking oil collection center together with Shell in Penang. But what we intend to do is try to expand more in terms of operation and awareness because uh, it has to go hand in hand. Operation has to go and awareness has to come along because if, if there is no awareness, uh, there's no point expanding our operations. Of course, we are also always serving the FMB segment where we are going into the, uh, tenders, we are going into procurement processes to get uh, to the management of FMB and hotels. But where we see the biggest gap is of course in the household, which we intend to hit hard with the funding that we receive. Uh, of course, part of our funding will go into our ISCC application and also uh, bulk of it will be into a spend, establishing more collection points and marketing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're giving out 11% equity. Uh, we started out with four, four founders, uh, Shazwan, myself, Chai Chong, Louis, and also Praveen. Uh, all of us are actually from different backgrounds, honestly. Shazwan, our CEO, is actually from accounting and financing background. Uh, I myself, I'm actually a medical doctor uh, with KKM before I quit in 2019. Louis is our CTO. All our app development is actually done in-house by Louis. He's an engineering, engineering engineer, but uh, in programming and scripting and coding. And we have uh, our Praveen Krishnan, which is our CBDO. He himself actually is a part of the Churitos FMB chain. So uh, he has developed us. Uh, to get more oil from the FMB and the hotel segment. 
Yep. So I think that is it for now. I think my time is up. Uh, if there are any questions, do hit us. Uh, you can check us on Facebook or, or you can also download the Use Cooking Oil platform, Arus Oil, on the Google Play Store and actually start recycling to see the process of how we actually do it. And yeah, we, I'm open for any questions. Yep. We have one question in the chat box. Um, do you have any other CPO hedging mechanism for more stable revenues? Um, probably I'll get that. Let me... Um, yep, so we've studied on the hedging mechanism of this. Um, the best way would be having um, uh, a storage capacity where we could store um, other than that, would be having enough capital so that we could have enough time where uh, the the price actually moves to 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 where um, we want to sell it at. So actually, the hedging um, mechanism would be having enough storage capacity and enough capital um, uh, to overcome any economic difficulties. Okay, I hope that answers um, your question. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop in the chat box uh, and the team from Iris Oil can answer that. So we have a second question. Okay, second question from James. On your unit economics, what's your profit per one metric ton of UCO collected? Yeah, so uh, maybe I go back to this slide. Uh, we averagely, average out, we buy about one ringgit or one ringgit 50 cent L to 3 and 50 cent from UCO producer. These are actually in the household FMB and the hotel chains. Of course, when we buy from FMB and hotels, uh, the price is a bit more. You can go up to 3 and 50 cent. We sell it at about 4 to 4 and 50 cent. Well, of course, that is also based on the volatility of the market. On an ideal day, if buying from a FM, if we buy from a household, our profit margin will be 40%. From an FMB, our profit margin is in the 10 to 20%. Yeah, so if you average out, we get about 30% profit margin. And uh, yeah. Okay. So there's another question, right? What's the average turnover for these households? For instance, I do not deep fry a lot, right? Hence, there is minimal um, used cooking oil um, residue. So how do you tackle that? All right. So uh, when it comes to about used cooking oil behavior, uh, we did a market study and we found out that actually... Uh, the market that produces a lot of UCO are actually the household that has four or more. Those people with four or more, it doesn't make sense for them to grab or eat outside. They usually cook. And also, it goes down into the economics of the status B40, M40, or T20. So, uh, the, if, if we say like in the B40 community with a household market of four, some, uh, of four or more, they usually turn over about 10 to 15 kg per month. But, if you talk about M40 and the T20, yeah, it could be six months, it could be five months, and so on and so forth. But if we are looking at the B40 community, the household or more, they can do about 10 to 15 kg of UCO per month. But if we average it out, we, we would say that uh, every household would, would recycle about 2.5 kg per month if we average out the entire market. Lah. Because uh, this is based on the statistics of how much use cooking, how much cooking oil is consumed in the market. So you see, the problem is we already know how much oil is being poured into the domestic market for consumption, but they don't usually recycle it. So the, that's, that's where we are trying to hit, where we're trying to spread the awareness. We know that every household spend, re, consumes about three to four kg of UCO per month on average, if you average it out. But we know that it doesn't come back. It either goes into the drain or it goes into what. So that's where, that's where we are trying to address the the awareness so that people can start to recycle on a more frequent uh, habit behavior. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shai. Well, okay, think, last question. Uh, hence, is there a minimum you call procedure? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I answered that. Okay. Yeah. Yep, you answered that. Last question. What's your exit plan like? Okay, our exit plan. Oh, <laughs> uh, our <laughs> exit plan, okay. Our... <clears throat> Our exit plan is, of course, eventually to sell uh, M uh, M and A major acquisition with a with an oil and gas come uh, energy player. So uh, right now we are working with Shell. Uh, we are in a discussion to do more projects with them, and eventually, uh, because energy players are actually moving into the biodiesel sphere. They are moving into the sustainable sustainable aviation fuel sphere. 
So uh, eventually they will be the takers uh, of this of the they will be the they will be the biggest takers of uh, this Yuko pit stock, and eventually they will want to produce biodiesel for their own uh, production well. So our our exit strategy is obviously to go with a merger and acquisition or take over by an energy player. Okay. Well, with that, um, if any of you have any questions, feel free to drop us a um, question in the chat box, or if not, you know, feel free to email it to us. So we'd just like to share a little bit on Arus Oil campaign. So they are currently at pre-live and will be going live um, very, very soon. So you can scan the QR code and basically visit um, the campaign and learn more about Arus Oil. Um, so without further ado, um, we'd like to thank um, you know, both um, Dr. Chai and also Hari for joining us today. Um, so we will wrap this up on time, one hour. Um, yeah, and if you have any uh, questions at all, feel free to reach out to us. Um, some of you have requested for the video. Um, this is live on Facebook as well. And we will also upload the full pitch video on our YouTube channel at Lee Capital. So thank you everybody. Um, will basically um, reach the end of the event and we look forward to seeing you guys. And if you'd like to um, sign up for an account, just visit lit.capital. Yeah. <laughs>